Welcome back to The Francisca Show, a Jewish coffeehouse podcast where we encourage fellow artists and entrepreneurs to collaborate and support each other while sharing their stories. I am Francisca, a singer, composer, music producer, coach, and also your host. Hey, Francisca Show listeners, thank you so much for coming back. I know we're going through some transitions here, and I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, sticking through and being patient and waiting for the next episode to come out. This episode is really special to me. We recorded this episode a couple of months back when COVID-19 was just at its beginning, and who knew we would still be in this situation now? Well, hopefully we're getting out of it. And I am just so excited for you to listen to this episode together with Nisan Black. I think there's so many interesting topics that we cover in this episode. I also want to encourage you to reach out to me if you are pursuing your passion, your music, and you'd like to talk about how you can make that into a business. I'm also focusing on new ways to make this podcast more interesting and bring more value to you. Not that the other episodes haven't been interesting, but I want to make this more educational and more valuable to you. I have some ideas and I can't wait to share them with you. And keep reaching out because I love hearing from you. I love connecting with you and hearing your thoughts and feedback and all the incredible love I've been getting back from you. This podcast is one of my biggest pleasures. And yes, it's a lot, a lot of work, but I so love doing this. And again, I just want to thank you for listening. Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen. And if you haven't yet, Please make sure to subscribe on your podcast app so you can always get notifications when new episodes come out. All this content is free, so make sure to support me in that way. And here's your episode. Welcome everyone to the show. This is such an honor for me today to welcome Nisim Black onto the Francisca Show podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Happy to be on. Hashem's honor is mine. Okay, so I like to have our guests share a short description of how you got started in the arts and your background. They know most people do know your background, but I'd love to hear it firsthand. And if there are any details you'd like to add in to make it different, but feel free to take right. it. We'll keep it concise because we do know that most people do know right. a lot about you already. Um, well, introduction to the arts, I guess I was kind of born into it. My mother and my father were both rappers. My uncles and my grandfather also, too, was a musician. So I was kind of um, born and sort of groomed into music. It was sort of like, I wouldn't say like Michael Jackson style, but definitely uh, music was always a part of my life. So, And I recorded my first professional record when I was 13. And so... Uh, after that, um, things slowly start to take off. And then when I was 19, I recorded my first album and then took a break, I want to say in 2009, and then came back on the scene with God Elbaz and Hashem Melech in 2015, I think that was. That was that's pretty much how it all began. Okay, that's a great, extremely concise version of it. So uh, tell us yeah. a little bit about what it was like the music industry, we're going to, I'm definitely going to want to hear the comparison as we go out through this episode between the Mm -hmm. mainstream music industry and then how it compares to the Jewish music industry. Um, But Mm -hmm. give us some background with some detail on what it was. What was like there, um, very, very interesting. It was definitely more... um, more competitive, I would say. Also, too, there's a, there's a lot of lot of competition in that world, um, and I think also too because it's a bigger community, it's harder to break in that world. So, really finding your fans and being able to connect with your audience was a much harder thing inside of that world. Um, however, we started to you know break into it. Um, my my last single, I think, before I took my hiatus before music uh, was on MTV. We're doing really well on the radio, touring, Um, but it's just sort of a different perspective when um, 
I think people were more into um, more into just the the fame and the uh, who you are in terms of you know your, your stardom and uh, that type of thing. It was much more you know especially my beginning of it because I started off really like more in gangster rap. So the gangster rap thing, you sort of had to keep up that persona to to match those lyrics you were putting out. You know. Um, so you, you sort of had to find your way. You're almost like you were acting all the time, you know what I mean? In order to make people believe you were about what the things you were about. That was just my hey look of music because that was the type of music and style that I was in and the genre. So, so you basically chose the genre because that's what was available to you and familiar to you. And then you ended up writing lyrics that you, that fit with that genre. And then you had to act and live like those lyrics to match that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's like, you know, it's definitely everybody wants to put you in a box, right? So you want to choose a box that's winning. So if gangster rap was the thing that was winning, you know, you, you fit yourself, which wasn't not familiar. You know, I was, um, as you said, a lot of people know my story, but I was exposed to that early on. I was in a street gang. Very, okay. So yeah. So good. since I was exposed to everything very young and I was a part of a street gang also too when I was very young, um, it wasn't really hard to translate those type of uh the type of lifestyle and lyrics and then to put on that persona but i think something was taking place deeper inside of me than what was probably reflected in the lyrics and in the music but um so did feel like you know you had to put on a certain thing in order for people to accept you so you you had an in into industry because your parents were already right. rapping so what did that look like for you I didn't know, like, by the time I started doing music, my parents had been long finished. Like, they, they, they pioneered rap in Seattle, Washington. So that was, like, early 80s. I was born in 86. So by the time I was born, they had already stopped music. And rap was fairly new around then. They, they hopped on it maybe a year or so after it, it just came out. So um, things just sort of, like, progressed. By the time I'm 13 already, I recorded my first professional record. So my parents were not really involved in music. But it was sort of somewhat of that royalty. It was a story to tell, especially locally in Seattle. I was like, hold on, wait, this is the son of such and such. And so my uh in some degree, made a uh, made a made an avenue for me to be able to launch, you know, especially out of Seattle, which made it easier for um, both the people that were older than me, the generation above, and the ones that my you know, my, my, my immediate fans to sort of support me because of, because of that link and that connection. It was sort of like a lot of people had a car towards my parents for, you know, getting the fire started with hip hop. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. So how does the transition happen? You are, you, you are already married and then you become Jewish or did that happen after? Yeah. No, no, I was, I had been with my wife. I met my wife when I was 17 years old. Um, and that was, uh, seven, woo, 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 woo. I'm not going to talk about years, but that was, uh, when I was 17 years old. And so that's when we started dating and our first marriage, we got married in 2008. Um, and then I want to say 2010 is when we officially started our gayers and, um, like midway through, it took us about two and a half years. So it was already 2013 again when we had our second uh, wedding. So uh, yeah, so we've been high school sweethearts to some degree. Is your wife a musician as well? Um, she can sing, but she doesn't like to. Um, before, we, uh, before we were Jewish, she was singing like choir and different things like that at church. But uh, now she just sings around the house when nobody's around. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'd love to talk more about that on a different episode, maybe on a different conversation. Right. But uh -huh. I, I, we spoke about this once before on the podcast, but it's I think it's a super fascinating conversation because part of the process of Geras is that you have to reject your past, which in, in mm -hmm. a physical or in the most down to earth way it's rejecting your biological parents they technically don't they don't they don't stay your biological parents if that makes any sense uh so mm -hmm. did rejecting music or your music life happen through that process and if so how was that how was the transition 
how is the transition transitioning or bringing music back into your life especially making it a profession there might have been a, a break perhaps in your career what did that transition right. look like for you and I would love to hear on an emotional level or in a spiritual level what was what was that like um yeah for me it was even before the before um we actually went through um the conversion um, even when I was, when I decided that I wanted to officially convert me and me and my wife, um, I decided at that same time I wanted to um, take a bow. I wanted to bow out of music, just because I felt like my relationship to it, especially at that time, at the at that time I couldn't foresee into the future. Um, all all I knew is at that time I had a relationship to it. Even by then I was making very positive. My last album that I released in. Um, um, in the mainstream world was actually a very positive record. It had no cursing because I was already on my spiritual journey. So um, that record actually was very uplifting and very positive record. And it even did well, uh, more well than the gangster stuff I did previously, which is interesting. So, but the relationship and ties that I had to music, I couldn't see past, um, you know, that that feeling it gave me when I was around all my guys and the people that are involved with, I guess at the time, um, who I happen to love, very, very good guys, but it was just sort of like, I couldn't get it out of my head that this is what music is and this is what rap music is. So because of that, I felt like it was very necessary for me to bow out and still I hold by it, you know, um, that it was the best cleansing for me, you know what I mean, to sort of like depart from it almost like gave me the opportunity to really go after Hashem, to go after Yiddishkeit and to really um, push myself to grow without having that extra distraction, of, especially something that you love so much and being able to give it up. Um, so I guess I didn't have such a emotional withdrawal from it like I probably should have. Um, and I think because emotionally, I was, like I said, I was so on fire for Hashem that I almost didn't feel anything leave and I didn't feel them come. You know what I'm saying? I didn't feel all the new mitzvahs and the new things that I was taking on. I didn't feel that come in, like the pain of giving up anything, you know what I'm saying? And then leaving what I left behind, I also didn't feel because of this like burning fire inside of me to just grow. Um, and so, um, you know, later on as time went, you know, I still almost felt very like, I made the right decision. I made the right decision. And so it's not for me. Um, I think the hardest transition back to it was, you know, that the push from not only those close to me, my wife, my best friend, um, rabbis that were inside the community, um, friends that I even knew from, you know, outside of the community. It was like this major push. I say it was like a season, you know, of people telling me like, no, you need to, you need to go back to music. It's good for you. This is like, like whatever. And at that time, it was very hard for me to make it up because it wasn't just, you know, unfortunately, Matis Yahoo had sort of stopped living a religious life at that time. That happened. Um, there were other artists that that weren't as big, but it all was happening at the same time. And it was just sort of like, now's the time. No way. You know what I mean? I was like, if there's any better proof, it's like right now. Um, and so eventually that that transition you know so that that was it was harder to come back to it than it was to leave really to be honest emotionally emotional level because it's scary it's very scary because in my mind it was so hard to and every step has been scary every song every release everything is like it's like a scary step for me um even still i have those fears of like you know Hashem, and I, and I think that really that's been the key to my success in terms of like my Yiddish guide also too, is just sort of like that fear never leaves me. You know what I mean? I'm always afraid of losing Hashem, you know, in a good way. Could you talk more about that fear of losing Hashem? Is that coming from a place where, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. You're curious? Yeah, no, it's just sort of like, um, I, I think a lot about, you know, the, a lot of the time that was spent now, we, it took us two and a half years to convert, but like this journey for us really began in 2008 when we just searching and trying to find my way and the, the, 
emotional and spiritual experience that I had, you know what I'm saying, coming to realize that Yiddish was the path for me and that my neshama felt more at home by Kuala Yisra was was such an emotional experience and the answer to so many internal questions um, that maybe I had for many years. And so seeing, like I said, that transition of watching other people not really being able to maintain their religiosity and hold on to two things, you know what I'm saying? It's not just in music and other parts of the world, certain professions, it's very, very hard to maintain those things. At least it would appear to be. Uh, and so because of that, I always have like this fear of like, you know, I'm watching myself, you know what I'm saying? It's a certain thing that it's talking about, Missy Lai Yasharim talks about is the first thing of it is, is vigilance that a person has to have the heroes, it's to watch himself constantly. And so I think one of those things for me is like uh, one of the things that I'm very, very big on. I don't know why, but it's just like I feel like whatever it was that I had and what inspired me, I'm always looking for a shim. So an inspired song, it's like my song Mercy came out of that that type of feeling and feeling like a shim, where are you? At the first moment, I don't feel, you know, you know certain hair gets you care about the shim. Or I'm looking, I'm checking myself. I don't feel it like. I start to get worried about it, you know? So I think that music, because I know that it's so powerful and I felt like it was something that honestly, Shim called me to do, like he really lifted me up. I have a major reason to feel that, not just the rebellion, the whole story of me coming back to music. My son, he got sick with meningitis. I don't know if you've seen the story or not, but uh, so the story went that my my son, who was um, four months, um, got sick with meningitis and, uh, we were very scared. He was in the hospital. I think my wife was in the hospital with him for two weeks. And it was only four months. And it was a very scary time for us. Um, and this was around the time when everybody had really been pushing me to, like, make music again. And I was being very resistant to saying no. And I wasn't I'm not going back. I'm not doing it. I give up. And, it's, uh, and, um, and when he got sick, um, because I was because I'm a big hustler of Rav Aurish, Rav Shalom Aurish, and in one of his books he talked about, you should, you should, you should pray to Hashem for six hours. So um, I took it upon myself to go and pray for six hours. I don't know if I made it past five, five and a half, uh, because I was mamish exhausted and I fell asleep in, in the middle of like sitting down, like whatever. And I mamish had in my head, something came over me. Like I started thinking about what everybody had been saying to me, like, you got to go back out. You have to make the music again or whatever. And I was just like, so I challenged the shim. You, generally, you shouldn't do this. But I told the shim, I had a microphone. I was broken. It wasn't working. Me and my brother-in-law, we shared it. But I kept it because it was an expensive microphone. So I had it inside of my closet, I remember, downstairs. And it just, it wasn't working. Um, and and I prayed to God. I said, you know, this microphone that I have, if it starts to work again, then I'm going to take it as a Siman and Shim, this is what you want me to do. So after I was done praying, I went, I hooked it up, and it worked. And uh, after that, I was very scared. It was a very scary feeling because, you know, a certain type of thing when you know it's like, you know, it's only Hashim, you know what I mean? And I, and I was laughing, but I was so, like, afraid. So I went to go talk to my rabbi afterwards, um, Rabbi Shmo Brody, who was in Seattle now, was in Baltimore. And he like lectured me for like two hours. And then afterwards he gave me a bracha to make music again. Um, and other Rebaim also too I talked to after, but I, you know, I was good enough on on talking to him. And so I got a lot of encouragement from um, people that I really held dear of. And I just, I sort of went for it after that. And it was clear to me that it was something that I needed. And along the way, you start to see more and more fruits of it, of how just like, okay, well, yeah, what was I thinking? Why didn't I think about doing this? Of course I should have been doing this. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story, that personal journey of yours. And I, in general, I believe if you make that connection or reach out to Hashem in a specific way, then I don't know mm -hmm. about challenging or not, but you can see Hashem in wh whatever form or way you want to hear his messages and People who don't right. believe in it, they won't see it. And people who do connect with it will. Um, right, right. I, I think it's I think it's important to say because it's like, you know, for a person like 
like me who came from outside. I wasn't born Jewish, so I even had, you know, time in Islam as a kid, but in Christianity and then, you know, having to really toil to find find out and struggle for the truth. But one thing that I can definitely say is that I've seen Hashem's hand in so many different ways. You couldn't give me any amount of money in the world to ever deny the fact that it should exist. There could be no scientists, no discovery that will ever get me to Hashem is so real to me. And I've experienced Hashem on such a level that it's like impossible for me to ever think that Hashem, not only that, that he won't reveal himself to a person if a person is earnestly like really seeking and working on himself, trying to find the Emerson. Hashem will make himself present. It's like a meter connected meter. You know, if we hide from Hashem, he'll hide from us. But if we face reality and we're looking for Hashem, then you know, we go closer to him, he'll come closer to us. So Yeah. So <laughs> you brought up the conversation. I'm happy you spoke. You you brought up being experiencing other religions, which is so unique to a life in general. <laughs> I don't know. Right, right. I don't think I know anyone who's uh, experienced different religions. So I'm so mm. curious about that. I'm also, side, mm -hmm. side question, is there anything in Judaism that you found that either you can't explain to outsiders or something that is, I, I don't want to use the word embarrassing, but is there something that you're like, you know, if you're an outsider, you just don't get it. You don't get it until you're on the inside. Is there something that you could share that you've experienced? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess a lot of it sometimes is just like, you know, you know, we we have a certain understanding of of kedusha to a year that is very unexplainable. Um, you know, Rabbi Rabbi Baruch, I love this. There's a beautiful story I love to tell Rabbi Baruch and the Baal Shem Tov that they were once traveling and everybody knew the Baal Shem Tov was a healer. He was like a doctor, and um, they were, they inter encountered a certain non-Jewish man, and he was suffering with a lot of pain. He was having in his legs, I believe, and he he asked the Bolshem Tov, can he, you know, check him out, see what's going on? And the Bolshem Tov told him um, that uh, the reason why he was suffering so much pain was because of he was over a lot in the time in the area of Arias, the uh, relationships between men and women. And so the guy replied to him, he said, Well, what about you? And the Bolshem Tov's answer was, I'm already an old man. It's, it's not my type of life, you know, it's not for me. And so he went on his way. And Rabbi Baruch said, why did you answer him like that? Why didn't you just tell him you're a Yid? And there's a certain level of Kedusha to a Yid, and we don't behave in this type of manner. So the Baal Shem Tov said to Rabbi Baruch, you can't explain to a Goy what a Yid is. And Rabbi Baruch explained to a Yid what a Yid is, right? The variable between the Kedusha of, of Am Yisrael to people who are not Jewish. And certain things, like even we have in halacha when it comes to yain, and and you know if perhaps a goy touches a bottle that's not mevushal, like there's certain things like that, you know, you don't want to put on the news. So you know those things I find very difficult to try to explain to people. Um, almost everything else you can get over, but those those areas become to be very hard to like explain or to have conversations about. Yeah, definitely. That's true. It is uncomfortable. <laughs> so I want to bring up a topic that might be maybe uncomfortable to go there, but I think it might be important to talk about it. So I know mm -hmm. you've mentioned people like boxes and people love putting people into boxes. I think Jews and religious Jews especially love that as well. Right. And I'm sure right. entering the Jewish community and especially in Israel, and I don't like to speak badly about anyone, but discrimination, mm -hmm. not discrimination, sorry, racism or any sort of, if you're in a different community, we're not into you. So my question is not if you experienced it, but it has, was there this like, oh, now that you're a celebrity, you bypass a mm -hmm. certain, you know, level of right. you don't get to go to our yeshiva or we don't marry right. or whatever other experiences might happen i just my right. question is does the celebrity status override everything or is there still uh or is there still resistance no absolutely not sometimes i mean i guess 
you know, in terms of like, you know, schools and different things like that, some of the things that you were needed to override. Now, listen, I may be able to cut in line, you know, uh, at a pizza shop or to get an iced coffee because I'm nice and black, you know, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say those type of things have never happened mutually from the person at the counter and the people waiting, whatever. So at Brooklyn, there's some advantages, you know, and my wife is very interesting because her, she, she cannot stand the fact that everybody knows who we are and like people try to give us discounts or they try to give us free stuff or whatever. And I came to a realization, I told her, I said, you know, hon, you got to take this stuff because, listen, Hashem is sewing us up on the other end, you know, <laughs> with the schools, with the, with the color, people that don't know where we get enough mockles on the other side that Hashem's just balancing it out for us. So for you, it's like a, like a normal person because there is the other side of it where your celebrity works against you, you know, and it's not just because, uh, you know, I had issues, obviously, because of the color of our skin. So sometimes the celebrity aspect works against you because, you know, everybody knows who you are, right? So um, because of that, you know, getting into schools were harder. Um, wasn't just the color. Uh, there were, you know, also too because of the, the career, you know, so obviously the uh, rap music, which is probably a genre that's probably more foreign to Judaism than other genres. So because of that, automatically get taken as not a serious person, um, which you you get judged before anybody finds out anything about who you are as a person or anything like that. So um, people sort of judge you uh, by whatever they conceive or perceive from your music and who they see you as on online and celebrity, but then they don't know who you are. So you kind of get that sort of also too. And almost anything you do is some type of blog spot. You can't pick your nose in public. You got all type of stuff. <laughs> ends up happening uh, to you when you, so it doesn't bypass things. In some areas, it makes it harder. Yeah. Thanks for sharing about that. Um, yeah, saying your father is a rapper probably does, isn't a prerequisite to helping get into the more the most serious yeshivas out there. Um, so I'd love to ask you who your, who your musical inspirations of today are. Right. So it's very interesting because I don't, I don't, it's very hard to like to find much inspiration because I'm sort of like on a lone world by myself. I feel like a little bit. So not too many people doing what I'm doing. Obviously, I don't know how much it got out. We said it publicly, but I've sold the mainstream record deal. So now my music is actually going out more mainstream. And so uh, I have to be sort of like in line and playable with everything else that's out. But at the same time, I can't really be so involved in that music because it doesn't have anything to do with me <laughs> and my neshama. So um, it's very hard for me. So the truth is, honestly, I listen to a lot of music that is really the opposite of me. You know what I mean? Um, I don't really get inspiration from music. I get inspiration from moods, like sort of like my feelings, like what I'm feeling at a certain time. And because I feel like I have a good handle and a good post between me and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law actually uh, makes all my music. Um, and we have a good handle on time that's sort of like on, on the music itself that sort of everything flows out. Like I was just in the forest today and just watching these birds. I seen like this falcon like caught in the air, you know what I mean? And like my mind just works that way that my ideas start to turn out and my CD, not CD player, because obviously I don't have a CD, but at least music I'm listening to off my phone. I listen to uh, Yosef Carduna. I even listen to Zusha. Like I love uh, Shlomo Katz. Like, I, but all the soft stuff, even them, I never listen to like the up-tempo music, all the very slow, like mellow things. And it like really calms me down, I guess, and brings me to a level where I can like this, like I have my, he's both of this playlist, but I can't really find so much today that I feel like I can get into, you know what I'm saying? Cause nobody's usually talking about nothing. There's some <laughs> contemporary, I would say like, um, uh, inspirational rappers, you know what I'm saying? That are not Jewish, that are okay. Like this is a kid named NF or Lecrae. I mean, like, so Listen to them, I sort of get a pulse of what's going on inside of music to like stay current. But, and they talk about very beautiful things. They don't curse, they don't swear, 
but it's still like very hard to like find an inspiration. You know what I mean? It's a little bit more challenging, I would say, than what it used to be when I was younger. And I could just, you know, find inspiration from other artists, but it's very hard these days. Yeah. I hear that. Uh, we identify a lot with that in the Kalisha industry as well. Like girls have right. a lot of male Jewish music to listen to, but it's not so identifiable. It might not be in the right keys for them. So that's where the need to right. create Kalisha music is. And you needed every genre, obviously, as well. So, yeah, I right. hear that. Uh, let's talk about your latest music video mm -hmm. where you had three groups of dancers mm -hmm. and they were all representing something yeah. else and then you brought them all mm -hmm. together can you talk more about the inspiration behind mm -hmm. that and you came into the states to record that to film that, um, is that right yeah 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 i did um we flew into what did we do that we shot the video in harlem sorry in harlem and um the inspiration uh, really surrounding the three groups were uh, really three groups of me, um, really. Uh, my ancestors are obviously uh, came to America from the Atlantic slave trade. They were slaves brought here to America. And um, after being here in America, ended up being guys that were in the streets. Uh, we ended up, I'm not saying every black person, but uh, definitely my family and the way that I grew up was more in the street life. So I had a group of uh I would say street dancers that sort of represented more the pulse of the hip hop American urban culture um, that I came from. And then I had a group of black Hasidim because I became a Hasid. And it was sort of like, you know, these things that are always at war with each other, your past of who you came from, uh, the African American journey has been one of trying to figure out and puzzle the pieces of who we were before we came to Eritus, I mean, before we came to America. And and after you get here, you know, you end up, we've created a, a different culture to sort of like, you know, put a Band-Aid on where we came from. But when Africans come here, there's no like real connection between African-Americans and Africans who migrate, you know what I'm saying, to America. So you also still feel this difference. It's like, I'm not really African, you know what I mean? Um, American, but you know what I'm saying? Not really. So you have this like identity crisis, I would say that is like a big thing in the African American community. Like it, everybody feels, you know what I mean? Even till today, it's still felt and people still scrambling to, and my piece that I was able to find that sort of took me out of that race of scrambling and trying to figure out this and that was Yiddishkeit. Coming to Yiddishkeit sort of was that piece. So it brings shalom between the two groups that were at war with each other, uh, which is really representative of a war that was taking place, I guess, to some degree with myself, but in black culture in general. And I felt it was like very important to like show that with some symbolism and in a funny and fun type of way, um, rather than being too serious, you know. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I, I love all the dimensions to this project. <laughs> I think Thank many people you. can identify that on I think everyone can relate to some something in that that war right. within our different identities. All right. I the truth is that like a lot of people people that are close to me they know, the people that are not that close to me know. The the way that I think out things like creatively when I make videos or a song or anything like that, it's just very, very on a deeper level than what the eye meets, like um, very usually very calculated out and it's, you know what I'm saying, it's stemming for something and there's a lot of nuances, but that one was like one of the deeper ones that try to see like if people really catch on to what's going on and type of thing. But um, nevertheless, I have, a, I have a lot of, I had a lot of fun shooting this one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I want to know, is there anything that stands out in the music industry in the Jewish world that you cannot stand or is a pet peeve of yours or something that <laughs> you wish you could change? Trouble. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think it's, it's one of my things and my pet peeves overall that we experience inside of actual Yiddish guide also too. And this part of it's probably me coming from the Hasidic sect that I come from, a Breslov, is just like, you know, 
Rav Nachman was very big on in your own words. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of Jewish music takes psukim and different things like that that may or may not be t doing justice to the original author of them. You know what I'm saying? In the context sometimes of what we're using. But, and I feel like, you know, I wish there was more original music inside of, in, in, in Jewish music because I feel like a lot of what we're falling off with um, the youth and why the kids rather listen to Goyesha music is because, you know, it's it's coming, regardless of if the lifestyle is appropriate or not, it just falls in line to what the person actually, words that come out from the heart go into the heart, you know? And so I don't feel like a lot of times we may be connected on a national level to Taylim, right? And even on a personal level, but sometimes when it's not your own story and your own truth, there's a disconnect between the listener, you know what I mean? I like to see more authenticity in Jewish music, um, meaning that the words coming from people's heart, you know what I'm saying, as opposed to coming from pasukim. Right. Um, I think that that's a major disconnect that's happening with the audience. And I feel like that's to some degree, some of the success I've had has been because you know, people felt these lyrics that are really coming from my heart. Just like, man, if we were all singing this, you know what I'm saying? We had an opportunity to hear, you know, even bigger people than me inside the Jewish music, just saying words. I feel like it would relate more to, to people. So may I counter to this? Personally, I write music to Psukim. That's exactly what I'm doing. And it's your pet peeve. It's quite funny for me. Yeah. But uh, I think the... No, it's <laughs> not that writing music to Psukim. It's that that's, that's all there is. You understand what I'm saying? So I like want to... It's, it's very rare to hear you. Okay. Yeah, so I think the industry, the way it's supported right now the most, at least for the male musicians, they perform at weddings, bar mitzvahs, and the music, the dancing right. music that's accepted is the psukim type of music. I don't see them dancing anytime mm -hmm. soon to English music. So because that's where the demand is, that's where the albums uh -huh. are coming through, and maybe they'll have two or three English songs on the side. I know Shweki did that, Benny Friedman does mm -hmm. it, Mordechai Shapiro, um, some Haliner. Um, but that's where the disconnect happens. But I know in the Kolisha industry, because they're not doing simchas with their music, a lot of their music is in English and is original. And it sounds more like the mainstream, uh, you know, the messages or the ideas that are happening mm -hmm. today. Right, right, right. No, I agree. I just, you, you know, you asked me what I liked, what I didn't like. So I'm just no, telling I you, you know, I understand. For me personally, when, when I look at music, it's hard for me to connect to um, to that because there's a certain I, there's more I want to hear from the artist. I I think part of my answer probably based on also too is my target, I guess demographic, which is more figured out as I go. But I'm always thinking about like the kids who are connected are the ones who are connected on paper, but they don't they wish not to be connected to the Yiddishkeit. And, you know, some classes are great, but I think, like, probably because my my heart is there. I mean, many different people listen to my music. I'm always surprised to see how many people listen to my music. And then, so I think the thing for me really is that I'm usually focused on, like, the kids, at-risk kids, or I hate to use that word because we're, like, all at risk in this generation. <laughs> Everybody's at risk. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, I guess that's more of who I in terms of maybe my message, it's not probably, I like making music I didn't have when I first even started even making music in Jewish world, like I didn't know who was gonna be my listeners. Everybody told me from people don't like rap, they're not gonna, whatever. So I definitely didn't have from people in mind at all. So um, so I just started making music cause I felt like that's what Hashem wanted me to do. And it just, it sort of fell where it fell. But now as I progress as an artist and I see where I feel the most needed, I feel most needed in those places with people that, you know, either feel a little bit more chesron because they're not listening to non-Jewish music or because, you know, they need something to to give them that, that boost to bring them back, you know what I'm saying? So I sort of feel like most, so I listen to music for that. It's just sort of like, well, how does it connect with those people? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's really beautiful and it's so needed. And it's so appreciated. I'd love to ask you. you what your mission is. And I know you probably spoke about it throughout this episode. And especially at this time with the coronavirus and people just 
life is just upside down for most people right now. Right, you, right. Ha, give us some chizuk and share your mission with us. <laughs> um, I think, you know, right now is that it's, you know, everything's shifted, you know, even for me musically and just um, my approach, what we're doing. Obviously, a lot of concerts got canceled and different things like that. Um, but I think, you know, what my mission has been and it's been more clarified for me is to um, go out and, and bring the awareness of Hashem being in the world, you know, um, both not only inside the Jewish world, but also in the non-Jewish world. My mission, you know, I feel like is to bring the awareness of Hashem into the world, like uh, in a major way, especially primarily through music. I think that was the tool that Hashem gave me to sort of get open up the doors a little bit, but I think not only in the Jewish world, but also in the non-Jewish world, uh, because any time, like, you know, I mentioned before talking about this video, everybody wants to know why, what are you talking about? What's the whole story? It's like, you're a conversation piece. Whenever I walk into somewhere, it's a conversation. It doesn't matter <laughs> where it is, whether it's in the black community, no matter if it's a Jewish community, especially if you don't know who, if you know who I am, all the more so. Is that the guy from such and such? Are you on YouTube? But if you don't know who I am, it's still like a conversation. Everybody wants to know who's the black guy in the Hasidic get, you know? I feel like uh, musically, um, I've been put to task to also present that light. Uh, my mission is to um, inspire the world um, to to in, inspire the world with the knowledge that there's a Hashem in the world, you know, um, both in the Jewish world and outside the Jewish world, wherever I go um, is a conversation piece. You know what I'm saying? Whenever people see me. Um, so I felt like it's one of those things where you can't hide. You can't run from your mission, just like you can't run and pretend like, you know, I can't blend in to any community anymore. I'm just sort of like... I have to go out and, and be the oddball. So, you know, why not uh, talk to the world about what I'm, what I, what I represent, which is, you know, uh, which is a shame of my connection to God. So I feel like that a shame is sort of like put me in a unique position to be able to um, talk uh, to so many different people, so many different types of cultures and to relate to so many different people. So um, I definitely feel like that's my mission. That's what I was created to do. That's a beautiful way. And your your medium of connecting with your audience, I'm assuming album downloads is not a primary source of income for you. So is it, do you do weddings or is it concerts only? What um, is yeah, so is the streaming, yeah, streaming is one um, that people stream on Spotify or Apple Music, which is really big. Um, but yeah, the primary thing is just, you know, Shabbatones, concerts, um uh, generally i'll come in like second dance i do a concert at a wedding but i don't do like actual weddings singing traditional songs um but uh you know camps summer camps different things like that have been sort of like the, the my primary way of connecting with people wow and i really hope this is a way that you support your family and you're not doing other things on the side yeah yeah <laughs> This is my it's been my only way of like, you know, for sure putting food on the table. Um that was one of the things for myself was like once I I got to a place and I really realized that I felt like a hundred percent this is what I shame wanted me to do. Um, I just made, made the leap and I didn't look backwards, you know. So and it's one of those things like the I think it's the Chobos Halabovos that talks about it that, you know, you know, at at some point when you know what a shim gave you to do. You do it and you go for it, whether it's up, whether it's down. And you're not allowed to say, on Rosh Hashanah, you know, it's all been, so I could just go do whatever I want. It's like, no, just like there's animals and there's birds and they have their way of relating to the world. It shouldn't give each person his way of what he's supposed to do in the world. So uh, I feel like it's appropriate to just go for my mission and not to look back, you know. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the show and sharing your story with us and sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome for me also. Thanks so much for sticking around until the end. If you'd like to get in touch with Nathan Black or follow him, make sure to check him out on Facebook, Instagram, on his website. I'm sure he'd be happy to perform at your events when COVID is over. So, 
If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share this podcast with your friends. Also, make sure to subscribe to this episode on your podcast app. And again, this is available on JewishCoffeeHouse.com, on FranciscaMusic.com, and on all your favorite podcast apps.